Hello and welcome to the Brunton podcast series. Uh, today we are sitting down with uh, a senior executive from BW Paper Systems. Um, I'm delighted to be joined by Martin today. Um, Martin, thank you for joining us. Uh, it was great seeing you at uh, the FEFCO Congress in uh, Copenhagen recently. Uh, as we discussed, I thought it'd be a great idea just to catch up with you for a little podcast, uh, give the audience an opportunity to hear how you guys are getting on uh, in the EMEA region. Um, so, Martin, let's start with um, BW Paper Systems, a little bit of background. Um, obviously, it's the combination of a series of brands. So uh, tell us a little bit about uh, BW Paper Systems for those uh, who might not know you. Yeah, uh, Dan, first of all, great to see you. Wonderful to be back uh, and, and, and um, seeing people again in FEFCO was, uh, was a wonderful event and uh, looking forward to the next uh, real live event where we get to meet people and uh, look them in the eye. Um, but um, yeah, back to your question. BW Paper Systems is actually um, um, a company that is formed from several well-known brands. Um, Markrip, Ward, United, Curioni, Vortex, k &H, just to mention some in the corrugating uh, industry, and there, there are more in the, in the paper industry, ECH, Will and Hamburg, and so on and so forth. There's about 11 companies right now. And uh, we are uh, owned by the Barry Waymiller Group, and this is a, a large American organization with, uh, uh, with over 120 companies under its uh, umbrella. But our focus is on the corrugating industry, and uh, people would often talk to us as, oh, you're from Ward, you're from Markup, and so on and so forth. Um, and uh, yeah, we're a US company, but I have been in Europe since 1987, I believe. Um, so well established uh, with a, a service location in Frankfurt and in Athlone in Ireland. And we have manufacturing sites in Italy, uh, Hungary and Germany. So uh, very well established here with uh, over 500 people actually working for us in, in the European operation. So uh, quite a large group. So, so Martin, um... Obviously, the last uh, 18 months or so um, you know, during the, the COVID pandemic, uh, it's been a struggle for all OEMs. Um, tell us how you guys have, have sort of um, managed to get through this, uh, this period in terms of, you know, with machine installations, um, with training, uh, because obviously not being able to travel and not being able to get engineers on site uh, has caused issues for all OEMs. So how did you guys fare the last 18 months? Yeah, no, I think then looking back when it first started um, the lockdowns and so on, I think we were very worried like everybody else was. How do we support our customers? Um, we have one advantage was to compare some of our competitors, and that is we, uh, we basically hire service people in multiple countries. So it's not just one central location where we have to fly everywhere. We've got people living in the UK, in Germany, in Poland, in Russia, in Italy, uh, all over. So we actually had a, maybe a slight advantage there because we could travel internally in the country, we didn't have to go flying people in and out. So that went quite well. Uh, we're very happy with that. And that's a structure that works for us. And also we got, uh, um, because our local people, they've got a much better um, contact to the customers in the area. So that was quite good. Uh, from a business perspective, um, as I said, we were first a little bit nervous, but actually it's been, it's been really, really good. Uh, I think all the suppliers in, in the corrugating industry and uh, finishing industry, us included, are busy and doing very, very well, thankfully. And, and Martin, obviously part of your, uh, your territory that you're looking after, Europe, Middle East, Asia, uh, I know that um, you had two very significant uh, installations in Saudi Arabia um, during the pandemic. Um, how, how did all of that um, sort of progress? Because uh, obviously, it wasn't just the pandemic, but there was obviously also regional um, uh, sort of conflict and strife. Um, so um, two really quite complex and complicated installations. Yeah, very true. Then. I mean, so for the main uh, European countries and even in Egypt, we had people locally, but Saudi Arabia, a very good example of where we didn't have a local technician and we couldn't travel. And uh, we had to find a way to support the customer. We had a corrugator installation, some finishing machines to install. And uh, we had to use our remote support um, capabilities. And we had that in place, but we had to really uh, uh, notch it up a gear, go faster. And uh, we, uh, we did, with the help of the customer, 
install or start with the corrugator. We already had it installed. We started it up. We started up some finishing machines, die cutter, flex folder, gluer. And, uh, and actually, although it took a little bit longer, maybe a couple of weeks longer, we got the whole factory running in, in really good time. Um, customer was delighted. Uh, and there was an added bonus because now the customer was more directly involved. It wasn't just us turning up and doing our thing and then saying, there you are, uh, let's, let's run production. Now the customer is more intimately involved and learned a lot more about the machinery because they, they were opening up the cabinets. They were saying, what do I do now? And we were guiding them remotely by video call or, uh, or other methods to uh, say, now do this, do that, and uh, off we go. So in that respect, then it was a huge success. We were delighted with that. Uh, and um, we also, as I said, had to um, accelerate our, the systems we had in place for remote support, which is going to stand us in good stead going forward too. So, so really a key takeaway there is, is that you've actually almost evolved your, uh, your process and uh, evolved the whole installation, training, remote support, et cetera. Um, and so obviously that's a key takeaway from, from COVID, right? Oh yeah, it is, Dan. And, and uh, absolutely, it shows what can be done when you have to do it. I mean, necessity is the mother of invention. And, and that's the case here too. Uh, of course, later on, we went back when we could travel with a, a certified engineer to double check everything was okay because we want to make sure everything has, has been done properly. We can't always see it uh, from, a, from a distance. And it was, it actually was really well done. Um, so I think that's a big takeaway for us and for many suppliers that um, you can do a lot of um, things remotely. And uh, it's also created an expectation for customers who now call up and say, my machine stopped, can you go online and fix it? And many times we can. Um, sometimes we need a bit of help from them, but we've already built that relationship. So they are willing to go out and check something themselves and not just throw it on the supplier to, to fix. So uh, lots of good things there. Good. And um, Martin, one of the other things that's come out of COVID, obviously, is, has been this knock-on effect um, with the global um, supply chain. Um, and, you know, obviously it's starting to impact on the, uh, the fiber-based packaging industry as well, uh, whether it's the raw materials uh, that the, the guys are using to, to, to produce the packaging, but more importantly, the machinery. Um, obviously, everyone's scrabbling around fighting for all the same semen systems and uh, all of the servo controls, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, what sort of impact has it had on BWP in terms of your own supply chain and, and what impact has that, that had on sort of lead times for new equipment, for example? Yeah, good, good question, Dan. I mean, yes, of course, we all have seen what's happened to material prices over the last, say, six months, nine months, even a year. It's, there's a shortage and prices are going up. It's not just material costs that are changing, also the shipping costs have gone up. There's a shortage of containers to move equipment around the world. So those certainly are some of the um, challenges we face. Uh, we are a global player. We manufacture in the US and Europe and in Asia. So we've been able to flex quite a bit and, and not have too big an impact from shipping costs. Also, we can source components in many different regions, which has helped us a lot too. Uh, that's been quite good. But um, you know, I, I won't say it's all, it's all roses. It's definitely a challenging time ahead of us because there is a shortage of semiconductors. There is a shortage of other materials and uh, we've had to adapt our purchasing uh, methods as well. We actually now are buying in more stock than we maybe would have bought in a year ago, just to have ample supply to build our machines because no customer will, ex will appreciate the fact that these machines delayed by two or three months because we couldn't get materials. So yeah, definitely a challenge is done, but uh, I think us, like all our competitors are taking steps to try and make it as, uh, as easy as possible for the customers. And, and Martin, you mentioned there that you have your regional uh, manufacturing bases um, in the US and in Europe and in, in Asia. Um, obviously those have been sort of segregated by product type, I guess. Um, but obviously um, I know, and I'm gonna tee the question up for you here, but uh, obviously, um, I know there's big developments that are about to take place um, within BWP in terms of rolling out um, specific new converting machines that are going to be built in Europe. Tell us about um, what's happening for your European manufacturing base. Yeah, Dan, you know, 
COVID and Corona and all the rest of it has been has been a blessing in some ways to uh, manufacturers for corrugating uh, and, and finishing uh, equipment. And uh, we are very busy uh, and we will be busy for the foreseeable future. Um, we also uh, want to focus more on each region and um, in Europe we have had a, a very good couple of years and we see much more business coming. Uh, we also see a huge demand for finishing machines, die cutters, flexifolder gluers. Um, so we actually are um, going to start manufacturing some of our finishing machines in um, our Hamburg location. Now in Hamburg, it's um, formerly the ECH wheel factory. Uh, they built equipment for the paper mill industry. Um, so your, your A4 paper, your A3 paper in your office is probably cut on one of their machines. Um, fantastic location, uh, great people, um, you know, great skills, and uh, they have some capacity to build some machines for the finishing industry, such as um, vacuum overhead stackers, uh, some flexifolder gluers initially, and a couple of new interesting um, products that we're going to be working on over the next year. And so more to come there. And, and uh, I know that uh, obviously one of the big drives that uh, particularly from your North American sales base, um, you've had a great deal of success with um, the inside outside printing. Uh, obviously it's the big buzz at the moment, everyone's talking about it. Um, but obviously in Europe, we, we are seeing this um, you know, double digit growth of e-commerce packaging and, and the inside outside printing. So um, tell us about some of the uh, customers that have been buying um, some of these, uh, these new Flexo machines with the capabilities for, for inside and outside. Yeah, I think that it was, I'm going to think about maybe two years back, we actually made a huge effort to um, convert our machines to print on, on both sides of the paper in one pass. And um, it, in America, it has been an, an enormous success. I would say America leads Europe with e-commerce, um, probably by a year, maybe a year and a half. And uh, of course, uh, our, our competitors have watched this too, and, and they're trying to get on the bandwagon now. Uh, but we have a, a, probably a two-year jump start on, on the majority of them. Um, so basically what, what's meant is, is um, the, uh, the packaging must be more um, presentable than what it was in the past, not just a brown box. Today, we get a, our goods delivered to our homes. We open them up and say, oh, wow, there's my new uh, telephone, my new whatever it is. And uh, the inside uh, printing has become more important than what it was maybe uh, some time ago. And Europe has finally caught onto this trend. And um, we now are seeing a, a bigger demand for that kind of machinery in Europe too. Pretty much every die cutter we build in the US today is going out with one to two inside print units. So we can print both sides. We've delivered a machine that had four outside and three inside printing units on the machine in, in the US. Uh, Flex folder gluers, maybe one color less with inside printing, usually one color. But I think there too, we will see a, a development that'll have maybe two to three colors on the inside of the box for Flex folder gluer boxes. So a huge, huge uh, market there that wasn't there three or four years ago. And um, just one quick question on, on the machinery and the capabilities. So uh, if you've got a, um, a machine that's maybe three or four years old, I mean, is it something that you can actually retrofit um, so that if you've got a standard machine, you can then add bottom print units? Yeah, it, it, it is done. We, we, we took special care when we were designing the inside print units um, to be able to go back to our other customers and say, don't worry no need to replace your machine, we can actually fit an inside print unit onto your existing, um, it's called a Ward machine. So pretty much any machine that was built by Ward from 2000 onward can be upgraded with an inside printing unit. It's easy to do, we can do it in the weekend. Um, and, and that now makes it possible for that customer to get into a market where maybe they felt they didn't need to be before, uh, but their neighbor suddenly has the capability and now they're losing market share and uh, have, to, have to react. So in that respect, uh, anybody who has a Ward machine or a Baltimore built machine uh, from 2000 onwards could get an inside print unit or, or two, uh, which, is, which is really, really good. And, and Martin, when we start uh, talking about inside outside printing, obviously 
um, we then need to think about the corrugator as well, um, uh, because obviously, you know, traditionally we're only printing one side of the sheet and uh, the corrugators, they tend to ignore the bottom side. Um, so um, what, what sort of work are you guys doing with your customers to, to sort of help educate them that effectively you, you've got to be thinking about starch application because you don't want washboarding? Um, an awful lot needs to be thought about. So, so. It, what sort of work are you doing with customers looking at their corrugators for upgrades on the, the single faces? You know, is it belted versus non-belted machines? You know, what, what sort of work are you doing with customers in that area? Dan, there's, there's a lot going on. I mean, um, our corrugators, I've got one right behind me here, um, basically are running in, in all over the world and they're running with some really fantastic papers and some are running with really poor paper. Uh, but it doesn't matter, we still have to make boxes. And um, definitely with the, the uh, inside printing, there is a much bigger focus on the quality of the inside of the box. Um, so uh, all our single facers are designed to run very light papers, uh, even on the inside, and yet not have um, uh, washboarding. So glue application is very important, a lot more focus than that over the last few years, uh, as little glue as possible, as little heat as possible. And, uh, and we've made huge strides in that area too, just like, uh, other set. So definitely um, the trend is uh, towards uh, micro flutes more and more, lighter weight papers, printing on both sides, uh, and our corrugators are geared up for that. Uh, for many years, of course, preprint was quite common um, on, on the corrugator, still is today, and we see even in the going forward a trend towards maybe digital preprint on the corrugators more and more, possibly printing a printed roll offline and then running on the corrugator. Or, or maybe even putting printing, printing machinery into the corrugator. Um, certainly, these are all things that are, are possible today, even with the existing technology. Great. Well, Martin, thank you so much indeed. It's been uh, great to catch up with you. And uh, I think um, I, I was uh, really fascinated when I saw one of your, um, your taglines, uh, sort of a play on from start to finish. Uh, you guys are using from starch to finish, uh, which is quite a buzzy uh, uh, catch line there. But but listen, Martin, for you and your team, um, wishing you all the best for uh, for Christmas. I uh, hope you all have a happy and safe uh, time. And fingers crossed that 2020 looks after us all. Martin, thanks ever so much indeed for joining me. Thank you, Dan, for uh, talking to me. And uh, I wish you and all the viewers a very happy Christmas.